the bots, the AI, and what it all means in terms of the future. I'm Brian. Welcome to my Tesla Weekend. So today we get a unique chance to chat with Dr. Know-It-All. Yes, he's really a doctor, and yes, he really knows it all. Although, uh, I guess if you have a medical emergency, he'll be the one to correct your grammar before uh, restart your heart. John, how are you? Okay, I'm having trouble hearing you. Can you hear me? Darn it. <sighs> okay, so um, we're going to be talking about the bot and about AI, but I can't hear you, John. Um, why don't we do this? <sighs> How about this? Let's just do this in Florida, okay? Let's do that. Ah, Florida. This is, wow. so, this is so much better. There we go. Yeah, I got to do this in more of the interviews. It's, <laughs> it's a good system. It's a good system. Just, so uh, I've already done your intro uh, just, just a mere seconds ago. There we uh, go. So AI day in three words, give it to me. <laughs> That's not even a fair question. <laughs> I was going to say very, very impressed, but let's say maybe my mind blown. There we go. There you go. That works for me. <laughs> so these days, how much AI is written by AI? I think more and more code is starting to be written by AI, but I don't know about AI code itself, like neural networks and things. But certainly I have heard at least about genetic algorithms being used with neural networks and I've uh, played around with it a little bit myself. I mean, that's not even a new technique. That's, that's ages ago that people have started doing that. So it's a little hard to tell because, you know, a lot of companies won't tell you what they're doing. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so, you know, no matter about that. But I, I think that that is something that, while it's probably not the primary thing right now, it's definitely going to be one of the primary things in the future and probably not even that long in the future. So it's moving in that direction. We saw the presentation. What is the Dojo hardware difference? Well, I think the difference comes down to what they did with the memory. They, they decided to go with, with uh, static random access memory or SRAM instead of dynamic random access memory. And that has a huge consequence to everything. So by dynamic uh, random access memory is what, you know, phone, uh, your computer, whatever. It's the stuff when it says, oh, I have 32 gigabytes of RAM. It's dynamic a a random access memory, which is absolutely fantastic and works great. But it, the, where it suffers is speed. And it's the trans, so it's, it stores information, but to get it back and forth from, to the CPU or the GPU or the neural network units, it takes a really long time in computer world, right? So, so 10 to 100 times longer than it takes for static RAM, which is on the chip itself, to go to the, the computation units. So what they did was they sacrificed all of that volume of memory to replace it with a tiny little bit of memory, just a couple of megabytes per chip. And everything else sort of flows from there, but it's a major design, design decision because it meant that they focused on interconnect and on speed and on how fast things could flow between the chips and how fast the information could flow on the chip so that you're, you're not, the, what the, the danger of a high-end computer is that it's doing nothing 90% of the time. So it does its calculations really, really fast and then it waits for the data to be transferred back to the memory and then get more information back from memory and then it works really fast for 10% and then it waits. So that's the, that's the danger and that's what Dojo is trying to get rid of. So what I hear you saying is they identified some of the bottlenecks Yes. and eliminated them, resulting in orders of magnitude faster speed. Yes. Yeah. With, well, the, with the sacrifice that they don't have a lot of memory on chip, which means that they've had to become very, very clever with other things. I think you're going to ask me about software next. That's my, going to be my guess. Well, <laughs> yes. What is the, what is oh, the Dojo well, software difference? Oh, gee whiz. So, so as it turns out, the, the software is the compiler has to be an incredibly advanced and precise compiler because of the fact that it doesn't have a lot of on-chip memory, it needs to be fed exactly what it needs, exactly when it needs it, and that's the job. The compiler is the thing that if you type out human readable code, it compiles it down into a binary that the, that's, it's, 
it's basically, a lot of compilers are kind of general ones. It's like if you have an Intel x80 whatever chip, it'll just work on that and it's fine. But this compiler is incredibly precisely tied to Dojo. And a lot of the compiling work is to make all of this memory juggling and everything as transparent as possible, plus a whole lot more. But, but the compiler is, is, is a huge differentiator for Dojo. So uh, is there a risk of having too much data? You know, they use the data to train the, the real life data to train the, the network, to train the fleet. What do you, how do you mitigate the risk of too much data? So, wow. <laughs> That, that actually comes back to uh, artificial intelligence again, to AI. That what they're doing, I think they have 500 petabytes is what I was remembering of, of memory, but storage, just general storage. But that actually turns out to not be an awful lot. And so I'm trying to remember the numbers and forgive me if I get them wrong, but it's something along the lines of 500,000 video clips that they sort of keep on file at any given time. And so they're sort of pushing through you imagine you get a new 500,000 clips from the dit from the fleet and you push out the old one and so that's continuously happening so they can't keep all the data so they have to use AI they have to use a lot of very sophisticated uh, code to figure out what data to keep so it's like what things are we not working well with right now like oh this intersection it doesn't work well so we're gonna keep data about that and, and throw away other stuff that we don't need. So yeah, too much data is actually a problem at this point, which is ironic, because most of us are always like, please feed me more data. Right, <laughs> right. So they just found a way to mitigate it. Yeah. So we saw Optimus, the beautiful little robot. It doesn't walk good, John. <laughs> Why is that? I, you and I know the answer. Tell. Tell the people who don't pay attention why that's not the problem or even the question. Yes. Yeah, so that is actually interesting. I think a lot of people have decided that, that like Boston Dynamics is the gold standard, which they are. I mean, if you want to look at a robot doing athletic movement, their, their, their robots are incredible, but that's not what Optimus is designed for. And the most important thing is that Boston Dynamics, the, um, the robots themselves are scripted, essentially. They, they, they run these, these Oh, they basically program it in, say, walk over here, do a backflip, right? So they, they have all this they're, stuff that they program in. They're on rails. Yeah, exactly, right. So they're, they're, they're doing their thing, but it's, it's like a performance. If you went to see like Cirque du Soleil and they were robots instead of humans, so you could just be like, do the thing where you climb up and then twirl down, upside down or something, right? So the, it's a scripted sort of performance. Now, I, obviously, Tesla bots at AI Day was scripted also, but the important part is that the vision system that Optimus has is allowing it to understand the world. So Boston Dynamics, yes, it has a basic rudimentary understanding of using LiDAR and other uh, sensors, but it's not really making sense of the world. And the beauty of Optimus is that the software, which is basically stealing from full self-driving, is, is making sense of the world and it understands the world. And the fact that they were able to build a robot from scratch, two, actually four, <laughs> four robots from scratch <clears throat> because one of them we haven't even seen yet but I, I know it was built um, they built four robots from scratch in the space of about nine or ten months or something and it can walk is is remarkable right so that it's you forget about the timelines right if you've been in business for 20 or 30 years and you've got a robot that walks it's like well great but these guys just knocked it out. They just cut it down I, to like one twentieth of that time. Well, but you know, high school high school groups can make robots that walk. Right. Yes. So the thing is, great. We can make it walk. Anybody can make it walk. We've seen that. I would rather have a bot that can water my plants yes. than than one that can do parkour. Right. <laughs> because I have no application for that. Yes. And yes. again, if I want a Cirque du Soleil show with robots, then I would need that. Right. But that's not. And the the difference a difference I notice is that. If you tell a Tesla bot, go outside, it presumably will know how to go outside. Right. Boston Dynamics has QR codes by the doors. Yes. That's how it, it's, you, you'd have to, you can't put on shoes, you'd have to carpet the world. <laughs> and that's, yeah. it's a big world, man. <laughs> and there's an awful lot of stuff in it. So yeah. Tesla got a lot of heat for going into robotics. Why would a car company do that? That's so dumb. But uh, Hyundai did it. Yeah. And Volkswagen, did you hear that they announced they bought a robotics company? Right. And why? Honda, of course, very famously. And Honda famously. Yeah. Yeah. So why do, why do you think Tesla uniquely 
gets the criticism when the other guys are doing the same thing, but worse. Man, <laughs> right, there's, uh, I don't know why they get critiqued. I'll tell you why it would make sense for a car company to do sure. robotics, especially an electric car company, because what is a robot? It is a bunch of pieces of, you know, some sort of steel aluminum material that's an exoskeleton off of which you hang very clever actuators and, and joints and things like that. This is all stuff that's kind of in the wheelhouse of an automobile manufacturer. Now, especially an EV um, vehicle manufacturer, because, you know, ice, ice engines, you're probably not gonna, <laughs> I'm imagining starting it like, you, know, you start your robot. But, they, but that's what the early Boston Dynamics, yes, yeah, and, yeah. and you'll notice when you go back and watch those videos, you can't find very many where you with audio. No, no. Because they, they had so to. Loud. They were. They were. Right. That would have been a very different demo. Right. <laughs> stealth. Stealth was not there. Well, even now it's not because they use hydraulics. Yeah. So you hear them and they're like. Rrr! You know. Yeah, they, like they yeah. <laughs> they're louder than RoboCop. Right. And uh, Waymo's had some executives depart from their self-driving division. Right. Uh, Uber and Lyft have sold off their divisions. BMW, I think, just gave up entirely. Right. And who was the recent one? I think I've got it written down. Um, I, I feel there's like been a lot. I feel like there was one more recently where we... Well, I know Waymo's valuation went from like $175 oh, billion to $35 Intel billion. Intel is, is spinning oh, off yeah, yeah, Mobileye. Mobileye. Right, right. So are these companies coming to the conclusion that for them at least, FSD is impossible? Right. Or at least really hard and not worth Hard to a degree where they yeah. can see the cost getting those last batch of nines. Is that... Do you think that's what they're saying? Oh, I really think that's what they're saying. I, I think that they've they've done a cost analysis, right? It's it's a company, and they're like, we can pay this much money and get this much return, and they're like, that's not a viable. That's not cost. Viable. especially especially for a lot of these companies are at least associated with with companies that are struggling a little bit right now, and you know, in a recession type of environment, they're like, we got to cut costs, and this is an obvious one. So it's. It's, an, it's unfortunate that there's not more competition still going, but I don't think this is going to affect Tesla because Tesla is a company that operates in a very, very different, like Elon Musk is not your traditional CEO. Yeah. He's like, I don't care what it costs, do it. <laughs> right? Right. It's like, so I, I mean, say, he does care. He cares a lot about what it costs, but if he thinks it's important enough, I don't care what the cost is. I would say the only real competitor standing is Tesla, Waymo, Cruise, BYD, I guess, maybe yeah. some Chinese companies. Yeah. Who's going to be first to market with, with like a level four? It's well, anybody's guess, right? Yeah. I we mean, you could say Waymo see. and Cruise, you could say that they've gotten there already because they have limited range. Limited, yeah, they've where got small. But, but in terms of a general solution, I still think that Tesla's in the driver's seat. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I know, terrible. <laughs> but, Jesus, but. take the wheel. <laughs> so the, the, my, Another great metaphor. My, my thought is, it's, it's definitely coming. Uh, we were talking with Chuck Cook last night and he was saying it is, it's coming, but it's on over the horizon. We can't see it yet. Right. And so there's still gonna be a lot of, a lot of questions there. And so, and so with that said, I have to ask you, John, set in stone, concrete, nail it in. When is level four and five coming from somebody? From somebody. Anybody. I, I just don't see anybody, maybe a Chinese company will do it, but I don't see anybody, um, that Close I enough. know of beating Tesla at this point. Yeah. So I, I've said I planted my flag and said by five years from now, I th just a couple of days ago in a video I did, I was like, by October of 2027, absolutely we'll be having robo taxi rides. Yeah. So I think that that's very generous. I personally think it'll be about two years that we'll have uh, the first somewhere in Canada or the US or something, just because I could see a small town oh. or something just wanting some publicity. Turn it on. Right? Wichita, it's like, yeah. yeah. Wichita, the home of full self-driving or something. I don't know, right? So they, they would they would say like, look at the data, look safe, give it a go, see what happens. I'm going to Wichita. Yeah. Oh, well, John, uh, the commute here for the interview was pretty long. Yeah. Uh, my wife is barking at me for dinner. Um, <laughs> let's just go back uh, to our studios and wrap it up. Excellent. See you back there. And we're back. <laughs> that, was, that was a lot of fun. He is an amazing resource and uh, he knows an awful lot about things that are really kind of hard to wrap your head around. So I do want to thank John for that, for giving me his time so graciously. Uh, it's good to see him again. Yeah. 
So what do we miss? What do we misunderstand? Leave it all in the comments below. Your thoughts, your wisdom, your blind and brilliance, your juicy goodness, all that stuff. And stay tuned. Stay juicy. And I cannot wait to hear from you clever robots next time, I suppose.